Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to EcoSY. Today we're continuing our Women in Engineering series and we're very excited to have with us Rebecca Diederich and she is the Energy Project Engineer at North Carolina State University. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Oh, super excited. Looking forward to this conversation. And we love to start these episodes, Rebecca, just by letting our listeners understand your personal journey to the role that you're in now. Of course. So I'm going to start with a little background about myself as well, just so everyone can get a good picture of me. I'm originally from Rockford, Illinois, but uh, I've been in North Carolina for about 15 years. I went to NC State University for my undergrad. Uh, I got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And I'm actually working on my master's in mechanical engineering right now. And I'm working through it slowly but surely. I'm doing only doing one class this semester, but I'll graduate this semester. Uh, so I landed a summer internship in 2012. And stayed on through my final semester. Then the energy program coordinator position in energy management at NC State, also in the facilities division, came open. And so I applied for that and got that as well. And I was in charge of metering, utility metering there. So did like steam and chilled water and electrical for campus. And I did worked on smaller projects, uh, uh, energy conservation projects, like insulation projects for different types of piping and building envelope studies, uh, things like that. And then about two and a half years ago, I came into the role for energy project engineer, which is also where I'm currently at. And here I'm in charge of our natural gas procurement program. So basically just hedging or purchasing natural gas at a, the current price today for use in the future. So basically, if there's a good price for natural gas right now, I'm going to try to buy as much as possible or at least half of what we think we're going to use in the future and buy it now. So we're just protecting ourselves against fluctuations in prices. Okay. So, I mean, you're with your Emmy, I'm just curious how, from, from a mechanical engineering standpoint, what led you down the path for, for, with the energy path that you've taken? So honestly, uh, when I decided I wanted to do mechanical, it's because I didn't know, I didn't have a specialized thought of what I wanted to do with engineering. And mechanical is the broadest. So I thought, okay, I can go from here and just decide. And then with that HVAC design class, they would go into energy systems, different types of energy systems. And I thought that was so interesting and so I just got lucky with this energy program coordinator job that came open at first and just kind of slid right into the role. Well, that's great. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I got really lucky and it was a great first job. Um, and I just never left. I've never left NC State University since I got there in 2008. Well, so. I mean, you've got a great path going. I mean, you, I wouldn't necessarily call it lucky. I think, you know, you, you put yourself in the right position. You network with the right people and you've obviously proven value because you've changed your role and you've, you've taken on new responsibilities in this new role as a project engineer. It just sounds like it really lines up well for you. So hats off. That's awesome. Yeah. With this new role, I'm working more in the utility plants, which is where I wanted to be in the first place because it's larger scale energy production. Yeah. So I'm so, where I want to be right now. So when you say the utility plants, I mean, are you work at like the sites there at the university or, or other utility plants? So at the university. Okay. Very cool. I and mean, I've actually been to those. There are some, some nice utility plants that you guys have there, uh, creating a, a lot of power and, and, and moving some interesting things. That's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's a big university. We actually have five utility plants. That is awesome. So, so Rebecca, you know, this podcast series, we're, we're really trying to gear it toward the, the women out there that are listening to try to get them to come to, you know, STEM, engineering, industry in general. Any advice you would have for the women that may be listening that are considering coming to industry? Yeah, I would say, first of all, just be confident in yourself. It's a great industry to be in. There's so much room for growth. And I would say once you decide to go into STEM, really focus on your studies and try hard to really understand the basics because that will carry you through your initial career. 
And then once you're starting your career, just remember that you have been through the same class as you, the same degree as your coworkers. So keep that mindset. Don't ever think you're less because you're a female in engineering. So that's what I would say. Just be confident in yourself. No doubt. Other people see that too. Oh, absolutely. And they'll say, well, if she's confident, then obviously she knows what she's doing. Absolutely. So that, I mean, I've heard yeah. a, a couple of guests through this series say, you know, I, hey, I deserve to be in this room. You know, I, I got here because uh, I worked to get here. And, and you know, I love how you just said that confidence. You have to be confident because, hey, you earned it for a reason. It was not given to you. Exactly. You worked hard for that. You worked just as hard, if not harder than anyone else in that room. No doubt. Now, we also love to kind of walk through obstacles. I mean, we're trying to be re- real and bring truth to our listeners. So what are some obstacles that women may face when they come into industry? I think just being a minority. And so spotlight is always going to be on you. And so you kind of feel like you have to prove yourself. And in some ways, you may actually have to prove yourself just because it is so male dominant. But so like at the beginning of my career, I felt like some of my male co-workers would test me like, like on the side on different HD concepts to see if I actually knew what I was talking about, which part of me wanted to be like, you know, I'm not, I don't have to answer to you. So get off my back. But instead I was like, well, I already have this foundation. Like I, this is why it's so important to focus on your studies. So you have that solid foundation when you first go into your career. So I was answered the questions and they left me alone after that. So just prove yourself. You have to prove yourself because you are a female. Yeah, like those male colors would never, never ask another male co- coworker that same question. So you've actually, you've actually experienced that yourself. Yes, but I will say I don't want to that to deter women from coming into engineering field. That has no, that's few and far between, and that has not happened in a very long time. So in the short period of time that I've been in this industry, it has progressed so much. Really? Okay. So that that's that's encouraging to hear. I, I haven't heard a guest say that. So. Where, where have you seen that progression? Um, just in every day uh, when, when managers are assigning tasks, it used to be where I feel like the first person that would pop in their head would be a male. But now tasks are getting assigning, assigned to females over males. So it's no longer, it feels like we're more on a level playing field. It's not about male, female. It's about who is going to get this done and who is the smartest and best equipped to handle this. Right. And ultimately, that should be the the deciding factor anyway, right? Exactly. Very cool. Well, I'm I'm understanding more by talking with you why you are accelerating in your career. I mean, I can see why you're getting that more responsibility. So, one one thing I'm that I love about this series too, Rebecca, is, is getting giving people like yourself a chance to debunk some myths out there. Cause we're talking about obstacles that women are facing and you know, what it's like coming into industry. Is there anything that stands out that you would just like to just slam, you know, knock it out the ballpark on, you know what, this is what people think about women in engineering, but this is reality. Yeah. So I hate it when people say that women can't be like have top positions or top jobs in engineering, like CEOs, directors, or managers, because they're not strong enough or their emotions take over that, that drives me insane. So that is not true at all. I mean, although they are some of those few people with that old school mentality, again, that's few and far between. Just give an example. So tell you, this is actually true. <laughs> it's um, so we have four directors in my division and two of them are female. And in my group alone in energy management of the seven of us, three of us are engineers and we're all females. Okay. That's awesome. Yep. So the, the industry is evolving. Don't be afraid to get that engineering degree. Just go for it. Now, what was your, your, your mix in your classes? Was it, was it rated heavily male fe- versus female? I mean, what, what would you say the mix would have been? Oh, okay. So that was definitely heavily male. So I would say 90% male, 10% female. Okay. And for me, I mean, I was back, I graduated 03. It was the same for me, probably that 90-10 ratio that you're talking about there. Yeah, I've definitely seen on campus more women, though, these days in the engineering field and in STEM in general. Right. So that's nice to see. 
So it's probably different right now. It's probably more like eight to 10, but that's still not good enough, obviously. <laughs> no, no, it's, we got to get it up, you know? And, and one thing we're trying to do with the podcast, you know, obviously inspire and, and to, uh, to get women to, to consider this. And I'm curious on for you, Rebecca, any mentors or, or have there been anybody in your, in your career or in your education that have stood out to you? And just want to give you a chance to highlight anybody that may stand out to you. Yeah. So when I was an internet state, my boss, um, he's a male, he has four daughters. And so he knows what it's like to be around women and how to treat them and how to uplift them. So he really taught me the ropes of how to hold myself and how to stand my ground in the industry and also taught me like basic concepts for and, and engineering as well. So he was a, he was an all around mentor, just mentality wise and then technical wise as well. And I still we still work together today, but obviously I'm no longer his intern, but we still work in the same division and I still we still interact a lot a lot and he's like a second dad to me. So that was a really a really big blessing to have him as my first boss and the first my first job basically. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. Have you have you had that chance to be, you know, to pass it down yet to be that mentor to someone else? I haven't, but it's interesting you say that because one of my next goals is I want to get more involved with young females, young women, and really help to really help them to grow. And this podcast, funny and silly enough, is my kickoff to that that goal. There you go. So you picked, <clears throat> you called just at the right time. <laughs> so timing is right sometimes, you know. So that's that's yes. that's great. I mean. It, I think you'll be a great mentor to to many women in the future. And the fact that you recognize that and the importance of that, you know, hats off to you. And you mentioned from your previous mentor, he taught you about learning the ropes. And sometimes, you know, we do have to to stumble a little bit to grow in our careers. Anything in the past, any 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 stepping, um, any blocks or hurdles that you've had that you uh, that you've learned from that's helped you? So I'm going to go for from more technical standpoint on one of the projects I completed that I completely failed at. Okay. <laughs> so it was a one of it's a project in one of the engineering buildings on campus. And it was basically it was an energy conservation project. Um, and it was to stop install basically these big boxes with filters in them. And you install them in an air handler. So an air handler is what conditions outside air to be sent to a space to cool or heat it. The reason you install these boxes is to help clean the air once it's been in a room and then just try to recirculate it instead of exhausting it outside and then having to bring in new fresh outside air and recondition it. So you're saving energy by not having to recondition air, basically. So these filters work best when there's a high carbon dioxide input. So basically, if there's more people in the building, it'll work better. And the units need to have that to work at a higher efficiency. Well, I did not do my research in this building because this building does not have a high occupancy. And so that CO2 load is not there. And so basically these units are just sitting in the mechanical room basement. And that was like $125,000. That was my first big project. This was a couple of years ago and it did not go well. That's not to say that we can't use it in the future when um, more students come in. We just need to really pack that building. Right. So maybe that maybe that's what I'll do. I'll just keep suggesting this building that we just need to put more students there. <laughs> hey, I'm digging. I, I love how you're thinking. You know. So, but I mean, <laughs> talk us through lessons learned with that. Yeah, basically, just do my research. Just the, the little things that you kind of forget about when you're so caught up in some new technology that you just want to throw in a building because you want to get it installed. But take a step back and really think about how um, that system is going to work. And if it will work in the environment that you want to put it in. No doubt. So just taking a step back from that excitement, <laughs> that yeah. initial excitement, just calm yourself down and say, wait, is this going to work? Right. Is it truly needed? You know, is this the right solution for, for the problem at hand? There you go. Right. How about resources that, that you study? We, we definitely like to try to give our listeners ideas on places they can go to improve themselves. Where do you find yourself going to sharpen your skills? So I've kept all my books from school. And I constantly go back to them, especially my HVAC design book. I have that with me all the time. And I'll keep my notes too in my old homeworks. 
and refresh my brain on those. Because now that I'm in the real world and actually see these concepts implemented, I have a better grasp on what I'm actually looking at in the old homework assignments and why they actually had us do those assignments in the first place. Right. You're able to, to apply that, what you learned there, right? Right. Applying those materials. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, Rebecca, and this, the role that you're in right now as a project engineer, when you find yourself in that moment where you're just loving what you're doing and you you feel like you're in the spot to where you just, you have so much joy, what are you doing at that moment? Well, first, I love NC State University. I went to school here. I work here. I have so much pride in this school. And one of our goals, campus-wide goal, is uh, energy reduction. And so whenever I can help meet that goal, so if ever I have a project and then I'm looking at the data afterwards and I can visibly see that I have reduced energy or done something, that makes me the happiest when I can actually visibly see the results. Okay. So any examples of that that stand out for you? Yeah, so I work with uh, what's called the recommissioning group. So what they do is they go inside buildings and basically just recalibrate the equipment that's gone out of whack since the building has been installed. And I've helped decide which buildings to go to based on their energy consumption. So it's a partnership, really. So I cannot take all the credit. They do most of the work, but I, (laughs) they do the majority of the work, but I assist in pointing in the right direction and then following back up with them on what they've actually saved. So I'm the data woman. <laughs> okay. So you have all the numbers. Yeah, I have all the numbers. They come, people come to me for the numbers. I hear you. I hear you. Very cool. Sounds like a fun project and, and uh, definitely can feel you on, on where you're getting that fulfillment at. So thank you for sharing all that, Rebecca. And we like to take these episodes too and kind of take a, a, a turn down a, the a, off of the career path and just let our listeners learn a little bit about you from a personal standpoint. So any hobbies or anything that you have, things that you do enjoy doing in your spare time? Well, I love playing volleyball. I've been playing volleyball since I was in fifth grade and I haven't stopped. So I try to play volleyball a couple times a week and that's basically how I've met all my friends as well. So that's a huge part of my life. And I'm also really into puzzles, like jigsaw puzzles. Okay. I'll always have a jigsaw puzzle on my dining room table because they just, I just love turning on the TV in the background and settling down to my puzzle. <laughs> so I wonder why is that? Is it, is it just a calming for you? It's a calming thing. And I just like the challenge. I have a very um, analytical brain. So there you go. I think it's just the challenge. So maybe you just need to get a jigsaw puzzle of a volleyball and then, you know, we cross both of them. They're at the same time, right? Why have I not thought of that? Thank you. <laughs> we'll see. If I we will can. do that. <laughs> well, that is awesome. So, did you play volleyball in college, or was it, is it all been recreation? Or so I played club at state um, all four years. I was the, the president of the club team my senior year, and then that's that was indoor volleyball. And after that, I transitioned more to outdoor. So like sand volleyball and grass volleyball, which is where mostly where I'm at now. Which one is more fun? Mm, at first I thought grass, but then I realized how much my joints hurt from jumping on that hard ground all the time. So now I'm going to have to say sand because it feels a lot better when you fall. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So I, I know our executive producer, Adam, he's a, he's a volleyball guy. He likes to play that from time to time. So maybe I can get him out there and spike it on his head or something, you know, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Awesome, awesome. How about family? We love to give our guests an opportunity to share about their family. Anything there you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, so I actually have an identical twin sister. (laughs) Uh, She went to UNC, I went to State, so it's that fun little house divided. That brings a Um, nice dynamic at the Thanksgiving dinner. It does, and it's so funny because my my family always tries to be so level-headed about it. And they're like, oh, well, UNC did this and basketball. And like, but State did this. I'm like, it's okay, family. We don't have to do this. <laughs> it's fine. Right. We know you love us both. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but she's actually um, in the healthcare industry. She's a sales consultant, and she works to uh, recruit doctors to place in hospitals. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And my mom, so my family all lives in Hillsborough now. Me and my sister live together in Raleigh, but my parents live in Hillsborough. My mom works at Duke University, and she is the associate director of a Duke's master's program. And it's a master's of management in clinical informatics. That's a mouthful. 
Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah. Important. So she, yep. <laughs> and my dad, he's a car salesman at Hendrick. Oh, so okay. Big, huge car lot in the back of that mall. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that whole, was it the Hendrick Auto Group? That place is huge. It is. It is so huge. He gets so many steps in a day. He has one of those step walkers. It's been great for him, actually. <laughs> yeah. Keeps him young, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for for sharing all that information you know, about your family. So it's, so I guess you started in Illinois, but I guess did they all follow you, you and your sister out here to the Carolinas or did you guys move out here earlier? So we moved as a family the when we were my sister and I were fourteen. So it was that um, the year before our freshman year of high school. Nice, nice. So moved moved to North Carolina and then had all these awesome universities that you could attend. So that's great. Exactly. That that was one of the main reasons that my family moved us down here. Well, that that is awesome. Well, well, how about things you're curious about? Any podcasts, books. We we love to get our give our listeners ideas. Of, of things they should start uh, investing their time in. Yeah. So I've been reading this motivational book. It's called Girl Stop Apologizing. I always say that like that in that little accent, that little sassy accent whenever I say the uh, that title out loud. That's, lo- just how, I, that's how I read it. I was digging it, man. That was awesome. I'm going to have to get Girl, that. Girl, stop my- apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> there you but go. It's, <laughs> it's by uh, Rachel Hollis. Okay. And it's a motivational book for women in particular. And it just really focuses how, on how to help women women reach their full potential. So I'm only halfway through the book, but um, one of the chapters was on analyzing your thoughts and why you have those thoughts or opinions about yourself. And so one of the opinions that I had of myself is that I'm a terrible public speaker. I was like, I don't know how I had got this thought in my head, but I've had this thought in my head my entire life where it's pretty much turned into fact in my brain. So reading that chapter really helped me stop and think, it's like, why do I think this? Mm-hmm. Like, did someone tell me this? Right. Like, no, I think I just get nervous when I'm, I'm public speaking, speaking in public, but my goal was to improve that. And so that, but this podcast is actually helping me. And this is helping me uh, achieve my goals as well, this podcast. There you go. There you go. Eco asks why being therapeutic and helping you achieve your goals. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll have to, uh, maybe we can get a, a link for that book. I mean, it sounds like a great reference. We could put that in the show notes. Any, any podcast besides Eco asks why that you love to binge? No, I'm more of a, um, HVAC design book girl. And then, uh, just these small little motivational books. So I don't do, I'm not huge into podcasts. Okay. So maybe I will be after this. Yeah, well, just just this one. You can be a one and done. That's fine. We just you know share this out, and, and we love our listeners and to check us out. So thank you for sharing that information uh, with us, Rebecca. And this has been a really fun conversation. All right, so Rebecca, we love to wrap up Eco Ask Why with the why. We get to the purpose, and it gives our listeners an idea of you know just – your personal drive and, and what, what gets you going, what, what motivates you. So if you had to summarize your personal why, what would that be? So I'm going to stick with the professional side of me and go with just energy conservation in general, just because it's so important to help the university reach its goals, reduce greenhouse gases, lowering utility bills, saving money. I just, I'm really big into the energy field. And I think it's just so important for the world as a whole, too. Yeah. So any little part I can do, I'm there for it. That aligns to such a greater purpose in, in the world. So, I mean, I, that's a great answer, Rebecca. So I just really appreciate you taking your time to share your story. You know, we're trying to inspire women and to consider this industry and to come to us. And just hearing people like you tell their story, your journey, different steps you've taken, uh, that, that gives the inspiration and that, that, that is what we're looking for. So I can't thank you enough for your time today. Thank you so much for reaching out. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.